Okay, well, hello everybody. Let's start now. I hope there's one or two there. I saw one person. Uh, the subject today, very presumptuous of me to, to deal with a subject like this, how to overcome self-righteousness. I have to be honest, to treat this subject as the title implies it's not unlike writing a book on humility and how I obtained it. And if I say, uh, I'm going to tell you how to get overcome, overcome self-righteousness, this has to be one of the most presumptuous ventures anyone has ever heard of. For who has ever overcome self-righteousness? And who is qualified to speak on this? Well, I'm not. But we're going to have a go anyway. Why this subject? How dare one speak on this? My reason, we need to see the subtlety of self-righteousness. That is, how it is a part of us and we're not aware of it. He who thinks he's not self-righteous has no objectivity. That is, ability to stand above or apart about himself or herself. We need to see the danger of self-righteousness. It is what is most obnoxious in God's sight. Strangely enough, it is very obnoxious in man's sight as well. We, we need to see the self-righteousness in ourselves. We must learn the signs, the danger signals. We must narrow the time gap as much as possible between the emergence and the discovery of our own self-righteousness. Uh, let me put it this way. How long does it take you to admit you have sinned? Now, I give sometimes as a definition of spirituality as closing the time gap between sin and repentance or closing the time gap between when you admit you were in the wrong. You're in the wrong, but then you take for years to admit it. Uh, I've known people to say, I will never admit I was wrong. I will never admit I was wrong. And their time gap can be years and years and years. And then maybe one day they will say, well, you know, I've been thinking. Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> well, in other words, if you can narrow the time gap, some do it to a few months. And then they cool off and say, sorry. Some narrow the time gap to a few weeks, and then they cool off, climb down. Some to a few days, some to a few hours, some to a few seconds. And if you can narrow the time gap to seconds from the time you were in the wrong, and then you admit you're in the wrong, you're getting there. Same with self-righteousness. It takes a long time for us to see our own self-righteousness. And for some, it is never discerned at all. For others, it may be detected early on, like the beginnings of a cancer. Well, self-righteousness is what keeps us from becoming Christians in the first place. I don't know if you ever thought about it, but not that we don't let self-righteousness creep in later on, but until we climb down from our self-righteous attitude, we will never be saved. Romans 10, verses 2 to 4. So, in dealing with this subject, how to overcome self-righteousness, what keeps us from true conversion is our need to prove ourselves to God without the benefit of a mediator. By the way, self-righteousness is what puts others off Christianity. It's the spirit of self-righteousness that turns people off from Christians and the church. So we therefore need to discern it in ourselves and deal with it if only to remove this as a reason people give for not coming to church. Self-righteousness is what causes marriage breakdown and tension in human relationships, as well 
as in the church. It is because both parties stick to their guns, dig in their heels, and the trouble gets worse. The one who is willing to climb down is the one who will admit to being self-righteous. It is the greatest obstacle to true spirituality. Immorality is no small obstacle to true spirituality. But believe it or not, self-righteousness is in some ways worse. For immorality is an obvious sin. Self-righteousness is the easiest sin to see in another, but the hardest to see in ourselves. All right, here's a definition of self-righteousness. A feeling of well-being, whether conscious or unconscious, that comes as a result of justifying ourselves. Now, the feeling may be conscious or unconscious. Now, if it's conscious, that's when we know we feel good about ourselves, and the reason being that we know we've got it right. But the unconscious is when we're not aware that we are smug, even though at bottom we're sure we are right. And so we will justify ourselves by defending our good works, our actions, and we just say, I know I'm in the right. And we feel very good inside. Now, there are two kinds of justification. The word justification means being made right or righteous. Okay, I'm dealing with how to overcome self-righteousness. Two kinds. One is justification by faith. The other is justification by works. When we justify ourselves, in other words, we declare that we're righteous because I've been a good person, I'm a nice person, I do good things, that is justification by works. A friend of mine uh, Rabbi David Rosen, Sir Rabbi David Rosen. Uh, he and I wrote a book together uh, called The Christian and the Pharisee. And uh, he's become very famous since he and I wrote that book. He was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen. He's the most decorated rabbi in Jerusalem. He's, he's been knighted by the Pope. Uh, and now he's been knighted by Her Majesty the Queen. So I knew him before all that. Well, in our book together, he is very clear. He's very clear that we believe we get to heaven by good works. Yes. So here's the thing. When we justify ourselves, it is because we feel our works or our words were right or righteous. And that leads to a feeling of well-being. It may be conscious, but it leads to gloating. It may be unconscious that leads to smugness. In either case, it is a dangerous feeling. Why is self-righteousness so dangerous? Well, number one, it's divisive. Second, it's difficult to see it in ourselves. You see, we say, I can't help it if I happen to be right. And then we become unteachable. It's not in a good place when we can't accept correction. We can't take any hint that you need to change. And then another reason it's bad, we become defensive. And worst of all, I call it the worst, and I hope that you that are watching me right now will agree with this. We grieve the Holy Spirit. This is the thing. It's very possible that if I look back over my whole ministry, I've been preaching for over 65 years, I think possibly, possibly, one of my major insights is seeing how easy it is to grieve the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Paul says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. The word grieve comes from a Greek word that means get your feelings hurt. You say, well, 
Are you saying, R.T., we can hurt the Holy Spirit's feelings? Yes. That's what I'm saying. It grieves him. I mean the Holy Spirit in you. You see, when, when I grieve the Holy Spirit, sometimes I don't feel it at first. Because you don't always get the conviction. But through time, and you get to know yourself and read the Bible and learn more, you think, oh my, I have grieved the Holy Spirit. Well, the thing is, if we develop a sense of sin and are conscious of how easy it is to grieve the Holy Spirit, then it will help us better and better to be less self-righteous. All right, here's the th thing about being self-righteous. It's being judgmental. Matthew 7, verse 1, Jesus says, Do not judge, or you will be judged. Let me ask you a question. Do you like it when somebody judges you? Do you like it when somebody points the finger at you? Do you like it when somebody tells you you're wrong? I don't think we like it. Well, if you don't like it, according to Jesus, the way to keep from being judged is you don't do it. Because if you judge, I'm going to tell you, you're going to get judged. Two reasons. One is, it's the instinct of anybody. When you judge them, they're going to want to defend themselves. But another reason is that God is watching. And it's only a, a matter of time that you're going to get it back. All right. Self-righteousness is essentially what lies behind the pointing of the finger. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 9, there's that interesting verse. Stop pointing the finger. And Matthew 7, verses 3, 4, and 5, it's a time when people you know, are pointing, uh, pointing the finger at you. There's a feeling that somehow we are competent to judge. And this stems from the feeling that we are okay, but others are not. All right. Being judgmental refers to motives. Does not mean that we should not make a righteous judgment. That's different. Uh, John 7, 24, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5, uh, talks about being able to judge what is right and wrong. But we're talking about when you point the finger over a person's motive, we are never allowed by the Holy Spirit to offer opinions on the motives or spiritual state of others. However clear that may seem to us. John 6, 37. All right, here's another thing. Being defensive. The greatest freedom, think about this, is having nothing to prove. The greatest freedom is having nothing to prove. So when you get defensive, uh, why would you defend yourself? If there's the freedom of the Spirit, because Paul said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Well, when you're really free, uh, when you're really free, uh, you, you don't need to defend yourself. And there's nothing to prove. But when we're in the flesh, we instinctively feel a need to prove ourselves. When we are full of the Holy Spirit, that need just disappears. Well, whenever we begin to defend ourselves, we inevitably point to the righteousness of our works or conduct. And this violates the promise that God will do the defending. You see, Romans 12, 19, it quotes a verse way back in Deuteronomy. Vengeance is mine. Um, let me say a word about this. The need to vindicate yourself and the need to punish another person because of what they do to you. God steps in and says, stop it. This is my prerogative. Only God, listen to me. I've had to learn this and I'm still learning it. Only God has the right to bring vengeance. 
You may know what it is to have somebody hurt you. They lie about you. A person betrays you. They do something awful. It can be life-changing. And the most natural feeling in the world is to want to see that person punished. To get even. To see them put in their place. You long to see it. Now, this is natural. You never outgrow this. You're going you're gonna to feel it always. When somebody gets at you, you want to get at them. But this is when God says, stop it. This is where I come in. This is my territory. I don't want you transgressing on my territory. And so it's hard. I mean, it's very hard. When you give up, you're tempted. Bring vengeance or get even. You want to say something about them. You want to run them down. Uh, some of you will know about my own teaching, total forgiveness. That's when you let them off the hook. They're not going to get punished now. You think, well, that's not right. This is why God says, let me do it. And you say, well, yes, I know, but Lord, you're so slow. <laughs> I understand. But the way to come to freedom, and maybe this is the most important thing you're going to hear today from this study in our school of theology. This is, by the way, a practical subject. We've had some heavy subjects. We have some light ones. I call this light, but it can be very heavy in that you may not want to take this on board. But when you set them free, let them off the hook, and if you can accept this, pray for them. And when you pray for them, you don't just say, Heavenly Father, I just uh, commit them to you. I just commit them to you. You're hoping God will kill them. That's not what Jesus meant when he says, Bless your enemy, pray for your enemy. When you totally forgive, you don't tell others what they did to you. You don't let them be nervous around you. You let them save face. You protect them from their dark secret. And you pray for them and you bless them. You say, R.T., I could never do that. I sympathize. It's the hardest thing in the world to do. But I can tell you, it is the greatest thing you will do ever do. It's the greatest thing you will ever do. And this brings you to a, a, a plateau when you are less self-righteous. Now let me put it like this. When Joseph forgave his brothers, uh, he actually said to them, it wasn't you who sent me here, it was God. You see, Joseph, the son of uh, Jacob, uh, was a very spoiled teenager. His son gave him that coat of many colors. Big mistake. <laughs> Jacob shouldn't have done that. There was one thing worse than giving it, and that was wearing it. And that's what Joseph did. He wore it. He wore it. Strutting it around in front of everybody only made him jealous. Only made him jealous. And then on top of that, I don't understand this, but I have to tell you, he had a gift of prophetic dreams. And God gave him a dream and said, one day you brothers are going to bow down to me. He should not have said that. He should not have said that. And that did not make God happy. And so God dealt with Joseph for his self-righteousness and his judging. It is the way he put his brothers down. God dealt with him. And then Joseph is sold to the Ishmaelites as a slave. It's a long story. I can't go into it now. But he became prime minister of Egypt. He was sure that when that dream was fulfilled that his brothers would bow down to him. He was sure that he was going to get to say, gotcha. He was sure 
he was going to be able to throw the book at them. But by the time the dream was fulfilled, 22 years later, by the way, 22 years later, it was a new Joseph. It was a changed Joseph. He had forgiven them. And the interesting thing that he said to them, you didn't do it. God did it. You know, they can't believe their luck that Joseph, who they were going to kill and then they sold to the slavery, is now saying God did it. How could he do this? How could he say that? Well, the reason is he knew that God had said through Abraham years before that Abraham's seed would be coming up out of Egypt. And that meant somebody had to get here first. And Joseph said, I was just here first. I was set here first. It's Joseph's way of saying, and listen carefully. When Joseph said, God sent me ahead of you. It wasn't you who did this. God did it. God did it for good. It's Joseph's way of saying, you would have done the same thing. I would have done the same thing. We're all sinners. And so when Joseph says, God sent me ahead of you, it's his way of saying, I know good and well that this is something God is behind. And when you understand that, you will not take something personally. And you won't point the finger. And so this is why God says, let me intervene. Let me handle it. And Joseph knew that he would be as guilty as any of them. He, he was just saying, I could have done this. And it wasn't until he got to that place that God could use him. And so I would say to you, and I don't mean to be unfair, but if you have a big tendency to be self-righteous, judge people, point the finger, it just might be that God won't use you until you're a different person and stop judging people and come to the place Joseph did it. Uh, did Joseph, the way Joseph came to the place, he got over this horrible self-righteous feeling. And God says, now I can use you. And so just remember, my point is, when it comes to vindication, vengeance, leave it to God. Don't go into his territory. All right. So here's the thing. When we do it, uh, uh, instead, uh, we will be pointing to our own good works. Here's another thing about being self-righteous. You will be argumentative. This springs from a hostile spirit, even if it is repressed, that tends to be critical and fault-finding. The word repress means to deny what we really feel and push it down into our subconscious minds. Many people have innately hostile feelings but manage to cover it up with a smile. And we need to be argumentative in order to prove a point that has self-righteousness as its origin. That's what happens. So one has not come to terms with his own feelings when you repress. It stems from a need to prove that one's point of view is correct and the other is wrong. And here's another thing. Listen to this. Smugness. Do you know what smugness is? Smugness is where you think you're a cut above everybody else. You see, the church of the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3, they said we are rich and increased with goods. Uh, they were smug. It's a feeling of self-righteousness. And nobody likes somebody who is smug. By the way, are you smug? Get over it. It's this feeling of self-righteousness. And people will just not enjoy your company. Well, this is when a person, he doesn't think he knows he's got it right. And he, is, he thinks he's a cut above others. Well, we all need to fight this. And I would think that this particular Bible study, if, if we can take it seriously, I need to apply it to myself. So when it comes to a study like this, don't you think that I'm pointing the finger at you? 
I need help here. I'm working on this. I'm an old man. But we never outgrow this. But we work at it. And the more we deal with it, we won't have that smug feeling. And people will enjoy our company. So, um, the above axiom that I referred to other uh, a moment ago, having nothing to prove, uh, that's where we don't wear on our sleeves. We think uh, that we're good or right. Uh, you've heard the expression, he never complains, he never explains, he never apologizes. I need to tell you, I, I lived in England for over 30 years. And uh, I don't know if you know much about a high-class Brit. And I, I'm talking about some of my friends. And I better, better be careful what I say, but I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, the high-class, upper-class Brit has this rule. Never explain, never complain, never apologize. Never explain, never complain, never apologize. And it leads to a smugness. It's not good. Well, a person like this never comes to term with his own heart. Well, let me move on on this subject, how to overcome self-righteousness. I'm working at it too, so don't think I'm, I've arrived and I'm teaching you how to do it. But you see, the self-righteous person likes to wear the mask to cover up deep fears of being found out. They cover up with everything from their accent to legalism. And they're difficult to reach and also to work with. Here's another thing about self-righteousness. It leads to holding a grudge. Now, I dealt earlier, a moment ago. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You see, an unforgiving spirit betrays that we have forgotten our own sins. We don't feel forgiven. The result being guilt, and which is the feeling that leads to blaming somebody else. The person who's always blaming probably has so much guilt in himself and he's covering up that. And so when we hold a grudge, it is because we feel right in doing so. It doesn't seem to bother us. And we believe that we've not done anything bad as another person. Remember, it's self-righteous to compare yourself with someone else. So we're wanting that vengeance. We're wanting our vindication. We long for the day they're punished. Well, it's a way of referring to our good works. God doesn't like that. The need to call attention to what we do or have done for the Lord, not good. Revealing how much you pray, fast, witness. Why would you do that? How much we give up for the Lord. Why would you do that? The need to refer to our spiritual experiences and make others admire us. We've got to be very careful. We may refer to the baptism of our spirit, of the Holy Spirit, or our gifts. It may be the need to talk about our severe trials and how we dignify them. Claiming to have no sin. That's the worst of all. 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. John didn't say, we have no sin. He said, if we say we have no sin, if we say it, that's a sin. And the person who says, we have no sin, that's the self-righteous person. Self-righteousness is one of the sins that God hates most. And perhaps the most dangerous thing about self-righteousness is its blinding power. I don't know if you ever have come to realize this, but murderers and adulterers often see nothing at all wrong in what they've done. It's equally easy to overlook our own bitterness or the need to gossip or to complain. So the closer we are to God, the more sensitive we are to our sin. And the more we are, the more defensive we are blind to our wrong. And here's another thing about self-righteousness. 
it's basically leading to self-pity or even springs from that. Do you know what? All murmuring, grumbling, and complaining is the result of self-righteousness. It's our way of saying, I don't deserve this. Really? What is it we think we do deserve? You see, self-pity is an easy trap to fall into, but when it is seen as basically self-righteousness, then we should confess it and run from it. And here's another thing. Not forgiving ourselves. I want to talk about that a moment. Not forgiving ourselves. Uh, many years ago, I received uh, an email from a man in California. Never met him. I would like to meet him. He has no idea what a blessing he was to me. Here's what he wrote. He wrote to thank me for my book, Total Forgiveness. And I appreciated that. But then he went on to say, Would you please, please, as soon as possible, write a book that will help me to forgive myself? When he said that, I thought, He's so right. He is so right. Because my book, Total Forgiveness, doesn't really deal with that. And it should, but it doesn't. But then I thought to myself, how can I write a book on forgiving ourselves when I haven't done it? When I haven't done it myself. And I thought, I can't write that book. I would be a hypocrite. I would be a hypocrite if I wrote a book on how to forgive yourself when it was one of my not only worst sins, I'm going to share something with you. This is not new because I've, I've been public about this before. My greatest guilt in my lifetime has been that I did not give attention to my family as I grew up, as I should. I look at the years I was in England at Oxford I put getting my doctorate first. And then when I went to Westminster Chapel, I thought, I've got to put the church first. And I put sermon preparation first. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. I was invited by the Billy Graham organization to do a 60-minute documentary uh, at the end of my 25 years at Westminster Chapel. And uh, they asked me a bunch of questions. They were, they were going to share this with ministers. They said to 50,000 ministers. And so they wanted to me to uh, do a documentary. And they asked me questions. How do you prepare your sermons? Uh, what is it like uh, being an American, living in London, uh, preaching to Westminster Chapel? What is your doctrine of the Holy Spirit? And then they said, well... We've got one minute left. That's 59 minutes. We've got one minute left. And they said, how shall we deal with that? And the man says, tell us about your role as a father. Tell us about your family. I said, stop. Stop. Don't film. Because on this, I've been a failure. I said, Please talk to me about, ask me about something else. I said, for, for 25 years, I put my church first, thinking I was putting God first. I put sermon preparation first, thinking I was putting God first. I now believe if I'd put my family first, I would have preached just as well. But it's too late. I can't get those years back. Ask me something else. And they said, that's the 60 minutes. Time's up. They filmed that. They not only filmed it, it's the only part they used. And they said this will help other ministers. All right. Knowing that, and this man says for me to write a book on not forgiving ourselves, I would be a hypocrite. But here's why I wish I could meet that man. He doesn't know how he used, he was used of God to bring me to the place I did. And I'll tell you something. 
the hardest thing I've ever had to do is to forgive myself, to forgive myself for not being a good dad. But I did it. It wasn't easy. Won't go into all of that now. Uh, I do it in my book, Totally Forgiving Ourselves. But here's my point. Not forgiving yourself, you see, can be a self-righteous feeling. And I have done it. And so when I come to a verse like 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, many say, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. I have to tell you, it was in my case the same. A sign of self-righteousness. It implies that we know better than God what is forgivable. And what God affirms, we must affirm. What God forgives, we must forgive, or we compete with Him. And God wants us to forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it is not worth anything to our morale. So not to forgive ourselves is not taking the blood of Christ seriously enough. Psalm 103, verse 12, the feeling that God owes me something. Romans 9, 20. This is the heart of self-righteousness. And God has, we say, God has a lot to answer for, and he owes me an explanation. Don't ever say anything like that. That's the essence of unbelief. That's the weapon used by Satan. If we feel God owes us something, especially if it is because of something that we have done, and we are being pompous and, and arrogant, and so the first thing that a sinner asks for is for mercy. And the Christian, I have to tell you, never outgrows the need of mercy, which means that we've got no bargaining power with God. We come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. Now, this is the way to come to forgiving yourself and getting over self-righteousness. I want to say one more thing before I go to a couple more points and then I'll take questions. There's a book, book uh, there's a verse in Joel, book of J-O-E-L, how God will restore the years which the locusts have eaten. That's a wonderful verse. Maybe you feel that you've wasted time. You live with guilt in the past and you can't forgive yourself. I'll tell you something that will encourage you. The very person that I neglected is doing the filming right now, my son T.R. To think in my old age, in my old age, I've got him back. My son, he travels with me. He does, he, he, he's, he, he works full time with me. It just shows that God restores the years which the locusts have eaten. And I say that to encourage you. You've got this great feeling of guilt. I understand it. But just be encouraged. All Things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the caller according to his purpose. Well, let me talk about the feeling of guilt. This is keeping a record of our own wrongs. According to 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5, love keeps no record of wrongs. And when we have not torn up the record of our own wrongs, it only gives the devil an easy opportunity to bring us down. There's something that might not, it may surprise you, it might not, but I'm going to tell you, God does not want us to feel guilty. And when we don't forgive others, we try to punish them by giving them a guilt trip. Well, if God had not forgiven, only then would he want us to feel guilty, but he does forgive us. Well, before I close, uh, two levels of self-righteousness. First, the non-Christian. All people are self-righteous by nature. You need to know that. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to show the need of a mediator. And the basic reason people do not come to Christ is because of self-righteousness. They don't think they need to do it. They may, they may be claim to be an atheist, yet, yes, yes. But behind that claim is sheer smugness. And before one can be saved, 
he or she must see the need of a Savior, and the need of forgiveness of sin through the blood of Jesus, the need of Christ's righteousness by faith in him. This means abandoning hope of salvation in good works or personal merit. It's putting all of our eggs into one basket. Jesus died for me. Now that's what a non-Christian must come to see. Now I want to uh, talk about uh, the self-righteous of a Christian. Uh, the Christian has self-righteousness. And so I want to deal with how to overcome that. In one sense, this is an impossibility because for a Christian, it is the one whose hope of salvation is only in the work of Christ on the cross. But unfortunately, here's what can happen. Christians can become self-righteous in a different way. I fear that all the examples of self-righteousness that can be given can apply to a Christian. It is sometimes uh, what uh, we hated God for, but God hates. One of the greatest obstacles to self-righteousness, uh, one of the greatest obstacles is Christian growth. For example, it is one of the things that grieves the Holy Spirit. So in overcoming self-righteousness, we must recognize it is our problem. 1 John 1 8, if we do not see it in ourselves, there's obviously no way forward. It is one thing to say, I know I'm not perfect. It is quite another to say, my problem is I'm self-righteous. We don't like to say that. Look at these as examples, whether any could be in you, how many. And I'm wondering if you are willing to say, I'm a self-righteous person. If you can say that and mean it, I don't say you need to blab that to the world, but it's very important to know this about yourself. It can be embarrassing, but it can be cleansing. And we say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my self-righteousness. The fewer number you admit to probably means the more self-righteous you are. The greater number you admit to probably suggest you are getting closer to overcoming it. So, refuse to compute any wrong done to you. Uh, that is to say, you tear up the record of wrongs, but also be clear that you must confess your self-righteousness. This means that we refuse to allow any wrong be programmed into our minds. We keep a record uh, because we intend to use them. Why do you keep records? To prove you've paid. We keep a record of wrong because we intend to use it. Throw it up. Well, self-righteousness. Admit it and then confess it and know God forgives you. Well, one last point. Total forgiveness is when it is as though no wrong had been committed. That's the way God forgives us. And to know this, that God totally forgives you. So it means that we should refuse to say things that are negative. So all problems that flow from self-righteousness don't really get off the ground until the tongue takes over and then we begin to speak things. And if we don't speak, no hell will have opportunity to break out. But when we speak a word that flows from the bitter fountain of self-righteousness, the devil gets in. Uh, so beware of saying anything critical, judgmental, that's not designed to bring a good feeling. Satan is always negative. And when we are negative, we often unwittingly mirror the devil. And we say uh, something that will not give a good feeling, and that can cause a problem. Well, I close with this. Refuse to clear your name. Let God do it. Don't even think of doing what God does best. Vindicating is one of God's favorite enterprises. He's the expert, and he has ways of doing it you would never think of. Leave everything to him. And I would say, before I take a question, don't raise a little finger to put the record straight. Watch him work out things in a manner you never dreamed 
Live by faith alone. Don't try to figure things out in advance. Faith is believing without seeing. Be willing to understand nothing that is going on at the time. Lower your voice. Wait and see what God does. And I'm telling you, you will have peace. You won't be perfect. You'll always have that self-righteousness. It'll be around there. Admit it, but be aware of it. It'll make you easier to live with. With that, I close. Okay. Anybody have a question? Your, your turn. Did anybody stay or did everybody leave? We have a problem? Yeah. So we've got a technical problem. It's our fault, not yours. I hope you're still there. We're hoping to reach you. Just, just a minute. Okay. Okay, Cheryl. Thank you. There it is. Okay, we. I, I hear from somebody. That's wonderful. Right. Say it again. Who are you? I'm, I'm Martin. Okay, uh, go ahead. What's your question? Well, I, I, I just explained to everybody um, how I looked at this, this topic of self-righteousness and I, I know that Jesus, we, when we get born again, Jesus gives us his, his own righteousness. Yes. So we don't need to be self-righteous, but I think what you've done, sir, is it's been really helpful because it, it's things that kind of, well, still need to work on, still need to work on. Well, um, that, thank you for that nice, kind word. Anything you want to ask ask about, have a question. I can make something clearer. A question or anybody else. Thank you for I that. I do. I oh, do. Okay, let's hear uh, it. When you you said don't raise a little finger to straighten things out, lower your voice and let God do it. What if the person like in Joseph's mm -hmm. life, what if his brothers had just kept up and kept up doing wrong things to him? continually. I mean, um, in, in my life, it just happens to be my mother, but, um, you know, that there, there's been a lot of things that have gone on in the past and I've, I've forgiven those things and I, I've tried to go on and everything, but I'm, I'm 65 years old and she continues to do this over and over and, and it just, you know, it, it gets very old, and yet at the same time, 
I'm trying to be respectful of her and honor her because she's my mother, but I also, it kind of wears me down because it's just, it just keeps up and she continues to tell everybody how wonderful she is, but how terrible I am and, you know, and all this, I've lost all connection to, um, you know, extended family and whatnot through the years because of things that she said that are not true, you know, but she's just made these things up and just continues to do so. And, and I understand, you know, she, she professes to be, you know, a Christian and, and, and talks about her Christianity and everything. And I let her do that. And I, I, I listen to her and I tell her, you know, that's great that she's, she's, you know, uh, listening to a sermon on Sundays or something, you know, but I don't know how to deal with me when it comes to her continually just dumping it on every single time, you know. Okay. Let me say, first of all, I understand. I really do. <clears throat> Second, I sympathize. I really do. What you possibly haven't thought about is how much you have an opportunity to have glory. Now, this may sound strange, but there's a verse in Proverbs that says, to overlook an offense is a person's glory. In other words, if, by the grace of God, you can come to the place that you can hear her go on and on and on and on and overlook it, that is your finest hour. You may not feel good. You may not be happy. You may want to scream. But the ability to overlook an offense is a person's glory. And all I'm saying to you, I sympathize. I, I do. And I don't think it's going to get any better. So what do you do? Yes. The only thing left is make it a God thing. And I can tell you it's only a matter of time. Even if, even if you have to wait till you get to heaven. I hope you don't. But it will be worth it all. You will not be sorry. If you can come to the place that you don't retort and you just simply say, well, God bless you, Mom. I love you. That may be yeah. not easy to take, but that's the best I can do. Thank you very much. Thank you. We finally got this working. Anybody else have a question? Yes, I have a question. Okay. So... I'm pretty sure that you said that you um that you did not put your family first and that's your biggest regret. So I'm pretty sure that over a period of time God would God was trying to tell you that. God was trying to tell you that, hey, put your family first. So would you say that it was self righteousness that prevented you from hearing him speak in that way to, to put your family first, to do things differently? That's possible. Yeah, yeah, I think that's possible. I don't know that I would have thought that, but as I look back, yeah, I think you can make that case. I think in my case, uh, I just felt, you know, God has put me in this uh, great church, Westminster Chapel. It's regarded by many as the number one pulpit in the whole world. And I think, well, God wants me to do a good job. And therefore, this is what got my attention. It was a mistake. And whether you say self-righteousness was part of it, unbelief was a part of it, wrong priorities. Uh, but all I can do is uh, uh, confess my sin and not look back. And that's my best answer for you. I don't know if I'm making sense, but I appreciate your question and what you've said. You want to say? Okay, thank you. I, I'm, I'm pretty so where so where could a person start at um, 
to to because I don't I don't want to walk in self righteousness. I know that there that there is that is there somewhere, you know. And I thank you for for the word that you share because it really opened up my eyes because I never I never thought of myself as being self righteous. But as you were speaking, or if I should say preaching, <laughs> um, you know, I, there there was some conviction, you know, that was there that you know that that is in me. So how so. Well, I guess I just answered my own question according to to all that you spoke. Um, it, it's really to go before God and and just really to go before with those things that I know that He convicted me with as you were speaking, because the Holy Spirit definitely did point out certain things, you know, um, that I that I that I do that I didn't realize was was from a self righteous spirit. Um, so I suppose going before God and and just asking Him to deliver me from this is a starting point. Thank right? you. Right? Would you say? I think so. And thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you. Do we have time for, yeah, we got uh, time for one or two more, depending on the question. I'll do my best. Marty, I'm again. Thank you, first of all, for this great teaching. And I have one question. How we fear a lot in the same time and how we calling in the same time Abba Father. Say that again. So how we fear a lot fear and in God. the same time we call him Abba Father. Because uh, the scripture is make difference between the reverence of the Lord and, and the fear of the Lord. Oh, the difference between the two? I don't think he wants you to be a nervous wreck, uh, but at the same time, you're under a sense of awe is possibly a better word than fear, depending on how it's been used in your past, uh, but a sense of awe. Uh, we're told in the book of Acts that they praised God and they feared him at the same time. There was joy, but there was also fear, and this may surprise you. There's a verse in Matthew 28. On the resurrection Sunday, they feared and were with joy at the same time. Figure that out. So I think the answer to your question is, is that if you lose joy, something's gone wrong. Uh, but there's a sense of reverence and awe, but also joy. God doesn't want you to be a nervous wreck kind of fear, if that's what, what you're getting at. Have I helped? A little bit. <laughs> well, I sympathize. That's probably the best I can do, uh, unless we had time to sit down together and I understand more fully where you're coming from. But for the moment, I'll just have to leave it at that. But thank you for your question. I thank you, Artie. We've got time for one more, I believe. Uh, Pastor R.T. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm wondering if, um, if if when people are insecure um, it could come across as self-righteousness. I mean, I know all sin is sin, but um, um, I'm wondering if, if, if a, lot, a lot of times when we're um, talking about self righteousness is isn't if it's just insecurity that com comes across as self righteousness. I can understand that. I think you've got a point. Yeah, I can I, I can accept that. And uh, I think uh, insecure people will be very self righteous. And uh, sometimes it comes across that way. Sometimes people notice it like that. They may not always. But I think you've got a valid point. Uh, Leslie, that's who you are, isn't it, Leslie? Yes, Pastor. Okay, well, God bless you. I think we're about God out of time. God bless you, too. Thank you. You might like to know we can do two more times in December. So, uh, when's the next date? 13th. The 13th, and then the 23rd. So, we've got oh, two sorry. more times together 16th. in December. 16th. Six, wait. 
16th of December. I've just made a mistake. It's December 16th. Yes. 1 6 when we meet next. Yeah. Okay. December 16th. And then the 23rd. And then the 23rd. Do you have the subject yet, TR? Yeah, next, next week is Gifts of the Spirit. Oh, next time, the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then, dis and the, dis th then on the 23rd, what is discovering it? Discovering Your Own Gift. Discovering, discovering Your Own Gift. So here's what we've got to look forward to. In two weeks, yep. is that right? Mm -hmm. It will be the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yep. And then the following week, How to Discover Your Own Gift. So that's two left over in December. These could be very helpful, very interesting. Okay, well, that's it for now. God bless you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Pastor Thank you so much. God bless you. Bye.